More than 6,000 years ago, this region adjacent to the Mondego River was inhabited by human communities who lived by herding and hunting. What was the mysterious impulse that led these ancestors to build dozens of megalithic monuments that still mark this landscape today? What was the function of structures like the imposing Orca Dolmen, built with huge granite stones weighing several tons? Come and discover Portugal with us. Please like, subscribe and leave your comment. Your support and opinions are very important to us. Thank you. The Orca Dolmen, also known as Lapa da Orca or Orca de Fiais da Talha, is located in the town of Fiais da Talha, in the parish of Oliveira do Conde, in the municipality of Carregal do Sal. It sits on the Emial Plateau at an altitude of 1,027 feet, with the Mondego River Valley as its southern border. Various mountain ranges in the Beiras region can be seen all around. The most prominent is the Estrela mountain range, to the southeast, with its high plateau marking the horizon. To the south, we can see the Esur mountain range, and to the southwest, in the distance, the Lausanne mountain range. On the northwest side, the silhouette of the Keramulu mountain range stands out. This region is characterized geologically by the presence of granite, which is occasionally crossed by quartz veins. This is an area with orographic characteristics favorable to human settlement, being close to several important watercourses, namely the Dão and Mondego rivers, and having vast hunting resources. The Orca Dolmen is part of a vast megalithic complex that includes dolmens, shelters, rock engravings and habitats, which currently make up the Fiais Azania prehistoric circuit. The route begins near the town of Lapa do Lobo at the Mouse Hill Dolmen, which was a polygonal chamber dolmen with a 24.6 feet long corridor. It was surrounded by a tumulus, an artificial mound 59 feet in diameter. The next monument is the Dolmen of the Saint, whose scarce remains indicate essentially the size of its chamber and corridor, as well as the tumulus that surrounded it. The Troviscus Dolmen I has been excavated and investigated in recent years, and traces of paintings have been found inside. Further west is the Orca Shelter, made up of an enclosure with six vertical stones around a granite crag. It was built at an uncertain time and may have been used over the millennia as a shelter by shepherds. It is close to the Orca Dolmen, the main monument of this circuit, which will be discussed in more detail throughout this video. To the southwest there are Dolmens 1 and 2 of Emial, two of the oldest monuments in this complex, built around 6,000 years ago. They appear as simple polygonal chambers, with no traces of any corridors remaining. Close to these dolmens is the Emial habitat, which consists of the remains of a Neolithic settlement, including the foundations of some dwelling structures and where remains of pottery and lithic materials have been collected. At the western end of the circuit is the Hayloft Dolmen, built around 3500 BC, but later transformed for use as a stable or farming warehouse, being surrounded by a wall in which some of the dolmen slabs were reused. Heading south is the Emial Rock Art Complex, which includes two granite boulders inscribed with engravings depicting various cruciform motifs, which may be simple anthropomorphic figures associated with the ancestral rituals of the builders of these megalithic monuments. 
Continuing south, we can find the small dolmen of the Viper, a very destroyed burial chamber that stands out only for the vertical slab that was part of the assembly that supported the monument's roof. The route ends at the Viper Rock, an outcrop with some carved cup marks that stands out in the landscape. It is associated in popular imagination with the legend of a Christian prince, a Moorish princess and a fairy. The most important megalithic monument on this circuit is the Orca Dolmen, both because of its size and its excellent state of preservation. It has been classified as a national monument since 1974. This is one of the largest dolmens in Portugal, having survived in an unusual condition for this type of structure, preserving its chamber and corridor in their original dimensions. The chamber, which is the widest and tallest part of the monument, has a polygonal plan and is made up of nine vertical stones or orthostats, only one of which is fractured. In the center, at the back of the chamber, there is a large central slab flanked by two narrower ones. There are three more vertical stones on each side, intertwined in a herringbone pattern towards the entrance to the corridor. The slab covering the chamber, commonly called capstone or table, is the largest and heaviest block in the whole dolmen, approximately 8.2 feet wide and 13 feet long. At the head, the dolmen rises to an impressive height of 12.5 feet above ground level, with the interior of the chamber being around 9.8 feet high. Closing the gap between the chamber and the corridor, covering an area that we can call the antechamber, we can see a large sloping block, the so-called guillotine stone. The corridor leading to the chamber is 25 feet long and has a total of 15 orthostats, seven of which are in the northern quadrant and eight in the southern quadrant. It preserves all of its roof slabs, one of which has a set of rectangular concavities carved out on its upward side, possible marks of a planned brake line to divide it into two parts, which was never completed. The Orca Dolmen still preserves part of its tumulus, an artificial elliptical or circular mound that once covered the entire monument and was usually made up of earth and stones. Here, the tumulus still covers the monument up to the height of the corridor and the upper part of the dolmen chamber is exposed with an impressive diameter of around 65 feet. It consisted of a soil matrix mixed with small and medium-sized stones on which archaeologists still detected traces of a covering lithic shell usually made up of imbricated stones. Even today, the Orca Dolmen is a structure that impresses due to the size of the massive granite blocks used in its construction, but what we can see is only part of how it would have looked when it was completed. The artifacts collected here allow us to place the building of this dolmen in the late Neolithic from 3500 BC onwards, in a period that corresponds to the monumental apogee of regional megalithism. The items recovered inside it by the archaeologists include arrowheads, pottery containers, scythes on blades and green stone beads. At the entrance to the corridor, materials were collected that suggest it was used at a later stage in the transition to the Bronze Age 2400 to 1800 BC. The construction of a dolmen like this one would have involved a substantial effort on the part of the human communities that inhabited this site, especially given that this is just one of dozens of monuments of this type in the region. The details of the building process of the megalithic monuments are unknown, given the absence of written records or artistic representations of it, so they can only be extrapolated on the basis of the knowledge we have about these populations. The blocks were extracted with stone tools from the granite deposits here and then transported to the dolmen's construction site by dragging them over wooden logs. The ropes used could have been made from vegetable matter or leather braids. 
It is thought that wooden levers could also have been used to aid in the process. The upright slabs were dragged to holes where they were lifted to their final vertical position by manual labor. To ensure the stability of the slabs, the remaining space in the holes was filled with loose stones and earth. The tumulus that surrounds the monument was then built until it covered it almost completely, after which it served as a ramp for laying the capstone. When completed, the Orca Dolmen would be inside a mound 65 feet in diameter and, at least, 13 feet high, the tumulus, which would make it an impressive monument in the landscape of the time. The simplicity of the construction process is only apparent, bearing in mind that we are talking about multiple granite blocks weighing several tons that had to be worked with primitive tools and moved using only human strength. A monument the size of the Orca Dolmen offers us more questions than answers, perhaps because we'll never know exactly how it was built, and more importantly, what it was built for. However, the search for answers to these questions cannot cease, and a good starting point is to characterize the human communities that inhabited this region 6,000 years ago. At the beginning of the 5th millennium BC, during the Neolithic period, the territory of the Middle and Upper Mondego was occupied by human communities whose main source of livelihood was herding. This settlement took place in open areas, with no particular conditions for controlling the landscape and no apparent defensive concerns, preferably on gentle slopes with exposure to the east. Herding was supplemented by activities such as hunting and the gathering and roasting of fruits such as acorns, given the prevalence of oak forests in this area, a very different vegetation cover from the one we can see today. So, what drove these communities to invest so much of their time in building dozens of megalithic monuments? What important function did they have that justified this enormous effort? In a study published in 2013, researcher Fabio Silva from the University College of London cross-referenced archaeological and astronomical data to reach conclusions that, if completely true, are very revealing. The archaeological record from the Neolithic period indicates that there were seasonal transhumances between the lowlands, inhabited in autumn, winter and where the megalithic monuments are located, and the high-altitude pastures that the Estrela mountain range provided during spring and summer. Analyzing the orientation of the corridors of eight dolmens in the municipality of Cargal do Sol made it possible to see that they face a specific area of the Strela mountain range, over which the stars Aldebaran and Betelgeuse rise at a specific time of year. It was necessary to consider the celestial sphere as it was 6,000 years ago, in which the position of these stars was different to today as a result of the precession of the Earth's rotational axis. The star Aldebaran, the brightest in the constellation Taurus, was no longer visible from the end of February onwards and could be seen from inside the chambers of the dolmens, rising again behind the Strela mountain range between the end of April and the beginning of May. This ascent marked the beginning of transhumance, a time when pastoral communities moved their livestock from the lowlands of the Mondego Valley, where the Cargal du Sal dolmens are located, to the highlands of the mountain. Based on this observation, Fabio Silva suggested the possibility that the toponym Strela star, mountain range, resulted from the preservation of this memory through folklore and popular tradition, associating the mountain with the rising of the star that marked the beginning of transhumans. Several legends in the Strela mountain range region associate the origin of its name with a shepherd who lived in the Mondego Valley and spent his nights gazing at a star so bright that it illuminated the top of a neighboring mountain. One day he decided to follow the twinkling light accompanied by his dog. 
After climbing for several days, he reached the top and, impressed by the light of the star, decided to name the mountain and his dog after it, thus justifying the name of the mountain range and of the breed of shepherd dogs that is one of the oldest in Portugal. This theory, if true, also suggests the existence of a remarkable level of organization among the communities that lived in this region, materialized in the effort to build the Dolmens, as well as important astronomical knowledge about the appearance cycles of certain celestial bodies. The Dolmens would therefore be true temples with different spaces, with the chamber and corridor having more limited access and reserved for a few people and the tumulus and surrounding space forming a wider public enclosure. In the end, a monument like the Orca Dolmen wouldn't have just one function, it could be a space for religious rituals, for honoring the memory of ancestors and for observing the relationship between the stars and the landscape as markers of the passage of time and the seasons. Thank you for discovering Portugal with us. If you liked the video, please click on the like button and subscribe to the channel to follow our new releases.